Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second part of our two part series, Decorative Arts and the Market. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, such an exciting group of panelists joining us today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. So everyone knows there will be a Q&A at the end of our discussion. If you have any questions for the panelists or our moderator, feel free to ask those questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and also, just so you know, uh, this program is being recorded. And because you registered, you will receive a link to this recording in about a week. So um, feel free to come back and revisit this presentation again and again. Um, and if you enjoy Decorative Arts Trust programming, um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can do that by just logging uh, uh, checking out the Decorative Arts Trust YouTube page and you'll see an uh, icon that says subscribe and just click that and you'll be able to subscribe to our channel. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, I am thrilled to open up this panel um, and introduce our moderator, Ben Miller. Uh, many of you may know Ben from his uh, podcast, Curious Objects. And if you have not listened to Curious Objects yet, I highly recommend uh, you do this afternoon <laughs> or in the near future. It's a great resource for decorative arts fans. Um, but in addition to uh, his podcast, Curious Objects, Ben has been the director of research at uh, Shrub Soul since 2016. Um, he is from Tennessee, but he received his bachelor's degree at Yale, and he's a specialist in antique silver and estate jewelry, um, but also uh, well versed in all things decorative arts. Um, together with the Sewn Foundation Executive Director Michael Diaz Griffith, he is one of the co-founders of the New Antiquarians, a community of interest for the next generation of art and antiques enthusiasts. So please go ahead and check that out. Um, and without further ado, I turn the podium over to Ben. Thanks so much. Thank you, Carrie, um, and and thank you to everyone at the Deck of Arts Trust who put this um, this great series together. It's a privilege to be part of it, um, and I'm happy to be joined by a panel of dealers um, who represent a really a, a wide variety of different businesses and, and business models and areas of expertise. Um, I think it's accurate to say that uh, I mean <laughs> we'll find this out over the ne next hour for sure, but they all share I think a sincere optimism about the future of the antiques trade. Um, I, I certainly do. And while there is a lot that's changing in our little world, um, some things do remain constant, uh, like the idea of a commitment to knowledge and to beauty, um, connoisseurship, uh, and frankly, just the plain pleasure of the company of carefully and expertly crafted objects. Um, I'll, I'll ask each of our panelists to say a few words about themselves and their work, and, and then we'll dive right in. Um, Let's start off with Kim Ahara. Hi, Kim. Hi, Ben. Uh, can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Terrific. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thanks to the Magazine Antiques for making this possible. I love to talk about objects. So my name is Kim. I own a company called Q Antiques and Design uh, last month, 10 years old. I started the company in Newport, Rhode Island and moved it to California much later where I am today, Los Angeles, the capital of antiques in the United States, naturally. <laughs> I um, sell primarily online. I have a first dibs gallery and a cherished gallery, but I do a lot of work um, with TV shows as well. I am um, delighted to be here. I love talking about antiques and decorative arts in general. I specialize in the work of Marie Zimmerman, but I try to carry a pretty wide variety of late 19th through mid 20th century objects, generally ceramics and glass, but also silver and metal work. Uh, thanks again for inviting me. Thank you, Kim. Um, next up, Taylor Thistlethwaite. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Taylor Thistlethwaite. I am coming to you live from uh, Middleburg, Virginia right now here in my new gallery. I have uh, been in the antiques world since I was in college. And um, about seven years ago, I started my own business after working for auction houses in uh, Sumter Pretty for many years. And uh, I've been doing shows primarily uh, throughout the United States. Uh, 
I'm a true war road warrior. In fact, right after this, I am hopping in my car and driving to Cincinnati, Ohio for an eight o'clock meeting tomorrow. And that's a 10 hour drive in front of me. So we've got a lot of fun, but that's the antique world because you're always on the next, always on the trail for that next great object. And uh, let's see, I uh, recently opened up a shop here in Middleburg. I still will continue to do a lot of great shows. Uh, in fact, uh, I know Ben, I'm probably gonna be seeing you next at Delaware in November, but there's a whole lot of ones coming up. And uh, of course, we're excited to, for the winter show coming up in January. And uh, yeah, I'm an Americana specialist. Uh, I love all things American and a few English things and a few things that are kind of out of the norm. And, uh, but my primary focus is great uh, 18th and 19th century American furniture with a few 20th century things thrown in just for a little color. Fantastic. Um, coming to us from the UK, Karis Tyndall. Hello, um, I'm Karis Tyndall, a director at Charles Ede. Um, we're based in Mayfair in London and deal in antiquities. Um, so it's sort of the cultures around the Mediterranean basin, um, mainly Greek, Roman and Egyptian, and in essence dating from sort of the, the origins of art, roughly 3000 BC, but of course it, it can go a little earlier depending on exactly which culture we're talking about, and up until around the fall of the Roman Empire, so about the 4th century AD. Um, we exhibit, historically, we've exhibited at five fairs a year. Obviously, there's been a bit of an end to that recently. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to do a few more local things this summer in London. Um, we've got an exhibition in the gallery at the moment, just finished setting up today for it um, with a furniture dealer well, and, and fine art dealer. And, um, and then we're going to do another one in London um, called uh, The Eye of the Collector later on um, in September, um, which I'm much looking forward to. Fantastic. Last but not least, uh, Pippa Biddle. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Pippa Biddle. I am the co-owner and uh, co-creator of Quitner, which is an antique uh, store and restoration studio in the Hudson Valley of New York. I also co-write the object lesson columns in a magazine antiques with my husband, Ben Davidson, who is also the co-head of Quitner. Uh, we got into the business officially in 2018, so we're very new to it officially, but very much grew up around antiques and with a familiarity with material culture and objects. Um, we are very proud to still be figuring out precisely what our exact focus is. Uh, so I just say that we deal in art objects, which basically means everything. Yeah, well, that's a uh, wide enough berth to keep you busy. Um, I want to start off with a question actually about um, uh, older generations of, of antique dealers. Um, and each of you, we'll just take it in that same order, uh, starting with Kim. Um, tell us in just a sentence or two about a dealer who has had a, a great influence on your career. I've been fortunate to have a number of really great mentors, but one really sort of enabled me to start my own business so he's pretty significant his name is Jack Feinbold and he is brilliant and he's primarily a self-taught collector who turned himself into a dealer he bought a store front on Madison Avenue ran it for over 40 years before he retired and I was fortunate enough to work with him the last few years of that venture and he um he had lots of great advice, but uh, he had three things that he, you know, focused in on. And I, I couldn't agree more that it's harder to find great things than it is to sell them. Uh, I think the idea that if you like something, someone else will as well is really key. And that you can either make a market or chase a market. And I do a little of both. How about you, Taylor? Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, probably the biggest dealer influence to me was uh, Sumter Pretty, who he, he really has done a great job with creating a large academic study behind Southern decorative arts. Um, I love all things Southern, and that's my primary passion, but uh, 
and getting into the business, it's hard to find those great Southern things. So I've branched out a little bit past those parameters, but uh, probably the most important thing that Sumter taught me was to constantly think about objects in the larger picture. Uh, you know, for example, the piece from right there was made in uh, Southern Virginia, right on the North Carolina, Virginia border. And what does the construction and techniques tell about the bigger picture in Virginia? And uh, he is a brilliant, he's a brilliant guy, lectures all the time, but um, basically the whole world in Virginia rotated around Norfolk. If you understand that, you'll understand a lot of Virginia things. And it's something that was never really understood well because Norfolk was burned so many times. And uh, Virginia being the largest and wealthiest colony in the 18th century, or for the majority of the 18th century, um, losing its major city multiple times to fires and uh, just a civil war and revolutionary wars, that whole thing kind of happened down there. So uh, it, it, it uh, had a big impact on how we understand colonial America. So going from the object back to the big picture is always fun for me. That's great, thanks. Um, Karis. Um, well, it's probably not a huge surprise who mine would be, and that's Jamie Ede. Um, so Charles Ede actually was, was founded as a gallery in 1971 um by Charles Ede who um had run the Folio Society and and they you know sold books and then dealt in art and then he started specializing in antiquities anyway his um son took over in the 80s who was Jamie and then um and he was about 23 at the time when he started working for his father and got trained up by his father and then I met Jamie when I was 19 and throughout university where I was studying ancient history and classical archaeology um, I started coming into the gallery to help out more and more and Jamie went through a couple of bouts of illness and they needed a lot more help and I got on just incredibly well with Jamie and his wife and then started coming to art fairs and everything. Anyway, when I graduated age 23 and Jamie, none of his children wanted, you know, were interested in the business or anything. So he sort of went, right, this is going to be my protege and, you know, Karen's going to take her on and, um, and we'll start training her up. And so really, I've been in the, the business for over 10 years now. Um, but Jamie, especially in those first few years, it was so informative, everything he taught me about the industry, about antiquities and about being a dealer. And although he sold up the business and then myself and my colleague Martin Clist have been running it since about 2015, um, Jamie is still a, an important part of, of my life and, and helping guide us. And, um, and he's given me lots of little tidbits of, of just really, really helpful guidance. But two things just for anyone who's, who's interested in this industry that I would say that I think are probably the most important things he's ever taught me um, was firstly, make sure that what you buy, you really love. Don't buy something with a client in mind. Don't buy something because you think it's you can get more money for it or it's underpriced. Buy it because it's fantastic. And if you love it, your clients will love it. And if you don't sell it, you're not angry with yourself. If that client that you thought would buy it doesn't want it, you're not angry with yourself because you think, oh, do you know, what? I'll hold on to this. I don't care if I hold on to it for five years or 10. I love this piece and I believe in it and I back it. And, and that's just so important, I think, no matter what you're dealing in, because sometimes, you know, with your inventory, you can have a piece that's with you for a long time and you just don't want to lose faith in it because it's a fantastic object. But what we deal in is very niche. Not everybody, you know, has a sort of, um, you know, bus sized hole in their collection where they think, oh, I need that exact emperor to go there and I'm going to pay the price for it. You know, there might be, I mean, a lot of what we have is entirely unique. You just have to wait for the buyer to come along. Um, and then the second thing, and this is really sort of specific to the field that I deal in, is when it comes to authenticity of the objects, a lot of what we do, it's, it's about connoisseurship. You know, people have been faking antiquities for centuries. So something can look really old because it can be 300 years old, but it's not an antiquity. And when you have seen thousands, tens of thousands of objects as an antiquities dealer has and handled them, um, you get that instinct. You know, it's, it's sort of in your subconscious. And when you look at something you have to trust your gut and so his thing was if any part of you doubts it leave it 
don't buy it because something, even though you can explain away and you can have all the academic research in the world to back up why something's right, if your eye is telling you it's wrong, you've got to go with that because you'll never forgive yourself if later you find out it's not right. And actually you're often, your, your gut reaction is, is the correct one. And you can always convince yourself otherwise, but, but you've got to stick with that. Anyway, so that was Jamie Ede. I think um, participants right now maybe is starting to get a little bit of a sense that being a dealer and being a collector, there, there's a, a bit of a fine line um, between those two roles sometimes. Um, I, I want to um, direct uh, the next question uh, to you again, Karis, and, and I'll bring Taylor in on this as well. Um, we're talking about sort of transitions in the, uh, the state of the antiques market and the, the state of the uh, private trade in, in antiques. Um, and Karis and Taylor, you're both uh, deep specialists in your field. Um, I wonder what you think the future looks like for specialist dealers um, like yourselves and, and like me for that matter. Um, you know, are there going to continue to be specialist dealers in, in our generation, future generations? Um, does that depend on the existence of specialist collectors? Um, wh what do you think about that, Karis? Um, I think it's a very fair question. And actually, I think that we're going to become even more important. I think that historically, for a lot of specialist areas, we've we've had the specialist collector, and they've been so knowledgeable. They often don't even need you. They just need you there to provide the goods, but they don't need your guidance, and they don't need your your counsel. They don't need you to tell them something is rare or genuine or great because they know because they're a specialist. They're as specialized as you are. Um, and in fact, sometimes even more so because they'll collect a tiny little bit of, you know, we deal in, as you noticed, three and a half thousand years of art. You know, that's quite a, you know, a specialist, <laughs> you know, whereas they might deal in a very particular region in 150 years. But anyway, as those kind of collectors, I find, aren't around as much anymore, people are much more eclectic and, and they want to have beautiful, interesting things, diverse things from different cultures, different periods, objects that sing to them for a plethora of reasons, whether it's the aesthetics or the way they were made or the culture that made them. And, and they need to rely on people who they're buying from, who really know what they're dealing in to guide them, to tell them when something's genuine, tell them when it's really good, help them with the price of objects, someone they trust that's gonna sell them something at a fair market value. Um, and I think therefore actually, you know, will often sell, you know, sort of, half a dozen or less pieces to one person and then that's all they want because they don't want to feel like they're living in a museum but they do want to have an antiquity because it's such a thrilling thing to own a piece of history you know something that's so old so i think that whilst a lot of the specialist fairs perhaps might become less relevant because people you know i used to um, exhibit at a fair that went went on for decades and it was just antiquities but that stopped four years ago the fair because people just didn't come anymore you know you wouldn't get the pull it was only the specialist collectors because people want to go and they think oh I want something beautiful for this part of my home and I want it to be important and interesting but they don't know exactly what they're looking for and so they're probably not going to come to an ancient art fair so I think that we are going to be more important but where we position ourselves in the market is going to change and, and I think that that's the way that we'll survive, actually. And I think if, if you don't reposition yourself, then I think you could find yourself in a bit of trouble. And uh, to kind of back up what you're saying, I really feel that, agree with you wholeheartedly, that the dealer is going to become a more important part of collector's relationships. Um, because a dealer, I always like to say this, a dealer puts his money where his mouth is. And throughout history, it's so important to realize that when you are buying from a dealer, he is putting his whole faith into a piece, that he is honestly representing it, and that he is truly has faith in how great the object truly is. And for many years, and I know this is especially true in antiquities, uh, there were so many scrupulous dealers out there. And I, I feel like the antiques world has gone through a major transition in the fact that we now, we our reputation is everything. And if we get known as a dealer who handles poor quality material or might have handled a fake or whatever, you know, I, I have a guarantee with every piece. So if an expert comes out and finds out that something fooled me, 
I'm going to buy it right back from you. I, I have full faith in my object. And if we all get fooled, uh, you know, you're dealing with 3000 years of art. I'm dealing with 300 years of furniture, really. But, you know, it, uh, it, it's still something that we need to be careful with. So, and in dealing with collectors in general, I think they understand that a dealer serves a certain purpose. We all look at the same auctions, but if I might be able to find something in some random small auction in New England or in California that I just dig out and go, oh, this is perfect for this client. And the important thing is our business is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. And the fairs are so wonderful because as you were saying, you had the opportunity to sell somebody maybe five or six objects, but you, if you walk around the fair, they might go, well, you know, I, I want a, an ancient artifact or I want a great piece of silver or, you know, I'm, I'm interested in Zimmerman. What can you tell me, Kim? So th those are the type of things uh, or, and Pippa, I hope you do come to, to some shows because there's constantly people looking for things to get fixed and worked on, but I really feel that the relationship with the dealer and the client is something that should be treasured because I don't have clients. I have friends and there's certain friends I want to talk to all the time and other friends that, you know, I, I want to say, hey, I found something great. Let me call you about it and tell you about it. So this is a it's a business that that's been the hardest thing about not doing a show. And I, I don't know if you all feel the same way. It's been great getting to do these Zoom things, but how wonderful it is to sit down with a client or a friend and have a drink over a great piece of 18th century furniture and be able to sit and laugh about how, oh, the carving on this foot makes me so happy. You know, and that, that's what we need to get excited about with people because uh, as Cheris was saying, we, we have, our collectors are very smart people. They know what they're doing, but, when you buy at an auction, you get excited raising your hand. When you buy with a dealer, you get to share your passion for a piece. And that is so important. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. And actually, you know, I think one of one of the other things that, that we we have as specialists is, is the contacts as well. It's, it's partly the clients, but who the clients don't necessarily know to go to, which academics to go to, which other specialists there are that, you know, if you get something really niche in. So you might find something, Taylor, that you, you know it's great, but you don't know absolutely everything about it, but you know exactly who to go to to give you all of the detail you need. And that's really hard for your clients to know exactly who to go to, which museums, which guys are really, you know, the top of their field. And I think that's something that is invaluable that dealers often can bring and, and specialist dealers. But I mean, any dealer, we all know different people, you know, even outside of my field, I'll know, have, or I'll know who to go to again to give me the advice on, on what it is we might have. Oh, absolutely. So let, let's, um... Uh, take another sort of look look at the future from a slightly different angle here. Um, and I want to ask uh, Kim and Pippa, I want to ask you about the perennial question of millennial collectors. Um, and everyone seems to be flummoxed by this. But um, I know you have ideas about this. I think everyone uh, on the panel probably has <clears throat> ideas about this. But what do you think um, is maybe different about millennial collectors in contrast to previous generations in terms of um, either the, the types of material they're looking for or just the ways that they approach collecting and, and learning about the history of objects uh, and decorative arts. Um, Pippa, why don't we start with you? I can jump in. Um, I think it's interesting for me because when we first started going to auctions with the purpose of buying, not just for ourselves, but to build an inventory, um, a lot of uh, the time we were the youngest people, my husband and I at the auctions that we went to, we were dating at the time. I was 25, 26 years old. Um, and we were constantly hearing from people that people our age did not care uh, and how frustrated they were that uh, they couldn't move their set of six matching Windsor chairs. Um, and what we've had to sort of figure out how to articulate is it's not that people don't care who are young, not like millennials or anti-antiques 
it's that what they aspire to bring together in their life is, I think, distinctly different. Um, there is a move away from uh, as complicated as it may be, this mentality that I actually grew up on, which is buy the best that you can afford, buy only a few things if you can only afford a few, and take your time. And instead, people want to decorate their whole homes in a matter of weeks instead of a matter of years. And that means that they're doing sort of rapid accumulation and curation. And that I think is actually a really interesting opportunity. It's giving a lot of objects that have been overlooked for a long time, um, a chance at the spotlight for us in restoration mm -hmm. repairs. It's fun because we get brought things that otherwise would be considered sort of by uh, high-end antiques collectors to be, might as well be worthless to them as far as they, they're, they're never going to be shown in a high-end collection, but that are still fully functional pieces that are absolutely beautiful and might be quite representative of a certain style or a certain time period. Um, and we can help them continue using them, which sort of builds in an aspect of the millennial collector mentality, which is that collecting antiques is sustainable. It, there is a sustainability side to it. It is the most sustainable way to purchase new things to you is to buy things that were old already. Um, and that's actually a perspective that a lot of our clients are bringing to us is that that's something they're prioritizing in their homes and in their lives. Um, and we're able to help them uh, take that initial inspiration of wanting to be more sustainable and find their taste within that inspiration. It's not just about things being old, it's about building taste and curating your own life, um, which builds off of this sort of pastiche mentality of Instagram and social media. Uh, the idea that what we surround ourselves with is representative of who we are has only become stronger and stronger in like the Zoom and COVID era where what's behind us says something about what we prioritize in our lives. Um, and I think that that additionally is, is really interesting for me as a young dealer, as a dealer who's most of my clients are young, most of our clients are young, and who's able to work with uh, uh, our clients on not just finding one piece, but actually building entire rooms. I think it's maybe just worth as an aside noting that millennials are now uh, up to 40 years old. So, yeah. you know, the quote unquote younger generation of collectors uh, <laughs> not going to stay young forever. Um, Absolutely. Kim, what, do you want to um, add something to? Um, I do. Um, Peppa, that was spot on in my experience and you are a millennial. So I feel like it was absolutely appropriate to, to start with you. But I just, I want to add on that. I love working with younger uh, buyers because they're super curious about things. They are creative. They put things together in a way that um, is really, really bold. And, and, you know, the Wall Street Journal just a week or so ago, uh, published an article that talked about um, Granny's plates being back in fashion. And they're talking about, you know, Wedgwood, Royal Worcester, Limoges, but they're not talking about younger buyers going out into the market and buying, you know, a hundred piece set of dinnerware. They're talking about collectors buying plate by plate, piece by piece. And then to this creative tone, assembling it, making a tablescape. It's really highly individual. And this is, I think, what you were talking about, Pippo, when you said, you know, this is a way to design your whole life. You're designing what's behind you in a Zoom call. You're designing what you want to fall asleep to. And so I think there's a great opportunity if you're willing to talk about things like prints and, you know, an individual object versus, you know, a set of Windsor chairs. <laughs> I also um, think we should touch on this term that just was coined very recently called grand millennial. And, and this is a, a, a theme right now. It sort of comes along with this whole notion of maximalism and the English country home. It's not that stuffy, but it is, uh, to use your word, a pastiche of objects that are unusual and peak curiosity and beautiful. Um, they can be mixed in as well with IKEA pieces. It's, there are no rules. And so if you're willing to be creative, I think there's a lot of opportunity and I have a lot of fun working with younger buyers. I think just building slightly on that as well as um, the sort of design aesthetic is 
so hyper personal, but people feel more confident than ever in um, challenging what a room should look like and how a room should feel. Because I think we're able to see, looking, scrolling through Instagram, the work of so many different decorators. So many different, we're able to mm-hmm. see inside people's homes in a way that we've never been able to see inside people's homes before. And that means that we're not only influenced by our friends and our family and the couple houses that we get to go into, but we're influenced by literally like millions of people and how they think about things. And just before this call, I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw this amazing attic um, bedroom and I tagged my husband in it and saved it to our house inspiration because we're doing a renovation right now. And the fact that I can go refer to these things and have that as inspiration absolutely influences what I buy, what I sell and what I encourage other people to do as well. I think this is important. Um, millennials and younger buyers grew up in an information age. They can find the answer to anything in 30 seconds. And so they keep you honest. They're very careful with their money. Um, I wouldn't say cheap if they love something, they will buy it, but um, they know what it should cost. Generally, if um, they're going to purchase something, they'll do a little work on it beforehand. They'll ask lots of questions. And I, I'm totally on board with that. And I just, if I may, one more quick trend I've noticed is that um, millennials are drawn to brands, but not necessarily, you know, super precious things like Cartier is a perfect example. Uh, I often buy pieces of Cartier that were done in the 70s that were done in pewter and they were all handmade, hand hammered. They look just like silver, beautiful centerpiece bowls and cocktail trays. So they have the handwork, they have this lovely, you know, historic brand name behind it, but they don't cost a fortune. They're accessible. And I think that's part of the key. If you can marry you know, a great brand and a great designer, one step further, you're even farther ahead. So if you think about a mass retail setting like Target or H&M, when they bring in a designer to do a limited capsule collection, you can see a little bit of that behavior when it sells out in, you know, a week. Um, people are paying attention. These are well-informed buyers. Um, I want to uh, sort of pose a question to all four of you, and I'll just open this up for a conversation. Um, for anyone who wants to chip in. Um, Is it necessary today um, to have a physical shop to do business out of? And and what are the sort of pros and cons? You know, we've seen um, quite a number of high profile, long established, multi-generational businesses move out of shops, move into offices, um, appointment only um, situations. Um, But others, uh, including the firm where I work, you know, we've clung to our our uh, street level shop front um, real estate. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I guess I'll start off on this one. Uh, since I'm the, whether it's a fool or the genius who just decided to double down on real estate, but uh, you know, I, with COVID, I've always been a show dealer. I never wanted, dreamed of owning a shop. I love being the free range guy who can go out and find great things at a drop of a hat. That's just who I am. But when COVID developed, I really felt the need to establish a retail setting. Uh, I live in the middle of horse country in Virginia. And um, it's just nice to have a space where I can display things and, COVID taught us a lot of lessons, I I feel. And one of the most important ones, again, is how important it is to be with our friends and have access to our clients and material. And I found that nobody, even though I had a separate section of my house that was dedicated to a showroom, they didn't feel comfortable coming to my home. And so I decided to open up a shop and uh, so far so good, you know, uh, I'm meeting a lot of new clients and um, you always have to, I think with retail spaces, I mean, Cheris is in Mayfair, so <laughs> that's a little bit more upscale than I, where I'm at, but uh, it, it's, it, is it essential to have a retail space? Not at all. You can do great things with antiques out of the back of your car trust me i've been i've done it for years 
but it's so nice to have an established retail setting that kind of, that lends itself to be a permanent place for you and a place where you and your clients can come in and if not talk about great antiques to have a glass of wine on an 18th century table and talk about the weather and um that that's a great aspect of a retail space that I, I really never knew about till I opened the shop up. Yeah, and I think I think I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, there are loads of of benefits to having a shop, of course. And and the biggest sort of thing that would stand against it is is really the cost of it. You know, it is very expensive to own a shop, especially if you're you've got a shop front, which we don't. Um, and that that helps. It also means that we don't get the tourists, the people who just think it's a museum selling, you know, and, and they just want to come in and have a look. And it means we don't have to have someone there watching everyone all the time. Um, but we are, you know, we're just sort of in a little courtyard off a of main street. And that that really suits us. But one of the things I'd say that I've noticed more in the last two years or basically since COVID is that as everyone has to buy online and is moving online, um, it's very difficult for people to know who is a legitimate dealer, who is, you know, sort of the real McCoy and who's someone who just went, oh, I'm going to sell some stuff. You know, I've got a very swish looking, you can have a good eye for creating a very good, um, you know, website and have an online presence and everything. And I think for someone who, you know, I've started looking at my own home, trying to, you know, consider buying things in different fields that I hadn't considered before. And you're going on to websites, you're trying to, to engage with the people, but knowing that they have a shop really helps you get you know um i suppose realize that these guys it's a thriving business you can trust them you can then go into the shop later there are lots of people that since things have opened up again i've been like great i discovered you online but now i'm going to go in and see you and have a look at the pieces and i feel like i know that they are um a sort of uh in essence it's like the whole putting your money where your mouth is situation you know that you're saying earlier it's like if you've invested in in a gallery space or a shop i think that says a lot and i think that's been very helpful and when i've spoken to um potential clients um and had a zoom call with them though we've never met them before um they've you know i've zoomed them from the gallery and i think that's been really reassuring for them that i could take them on a little tour of the gallery and i could then hold the piece there for them to have a look at and again they get that sense of okay you're a bona fide you know sort of mayfair dealer i feel comfortable buying from you kim i want to make sure to get you in on this because i know you, you have a somewhat different experience i do i i worked in traditional um galleries but do we need them no, we don't need them, but there is something reassuring to use Charles's word. It, it is reassuring to the buyers. So I, I think the key is you have to make the items available for uh, someone to look at and to, and to handle. So if I know a client and they're local, I will take it. If I don't know a client, I use a rental space and a shared office. Um, I'll you know rent an office for the day and set up a couple of appointments and bring things in. I think though that we may uh, circle back to an older way of doing business. Um, I am contacted by interior designers uh, frequently who ask for things on memo, which is sort of a throwback to that old timey turn of a, on approval. And so I feel that as real estate becomes more expensive and people turn away from these more traditional business models, we may see the return of on approval um, people bringing things into their home for you know a week or so some reasonable amount of time and that's going to be up to individual dealers about you know how they feel about it traditionally it's been a a no returns kind of business uh but i think that is going to change it certainly changed for me i offer returns on anything that someone's unhappy with for any reason at all i just want to because this is Sorry, it's such ahead. an interesting question um and what kara spoke to about real estate's really expensive and choosing to open a shop is a really big decision. And we had, my husband and I had a shop um, prior to COVID sort of out of convenience more than anything else. We moved into a house and learned that we were legally zoned where we could have a retail store in our house and chose to use half of our house as a retail store. It, it never worked very well as a house and it certainly never worked very well as a retail store. And so when COVID hit, uh, it really offered us the opportunity to rethink what we were doing. Um, and we decided that having a retail store was important for us, but it was not important enough 
to have one that wasn't precisely what we wanted. Um, so we chose to close our retail store and we still have a restoration studio and workshop. I'm actually in the second floor of it right now, hence the creative barn windows. Uh, but for us, it's sort of waiting for that perfect moment and that perfect place and something that Taylor has been able to do is create that space where people can gather, where they can come, where a retail shop can be everything that it can be. And then in the meantime, making online everything that it can be. Um, both can be extremely successful and viable ways of doing business if you commit to them and if you see them through and you do them well. Uh, both can fail if you don't commit to them and you don't do them well. Um, I don't think retail is dying anytime soon. I don't think that online is, uh, ever going to entirely um, sort of kill out the value of, of being able to walk in somewhere and have a conversation with someone. And, and for us, uh, our, our best clients and the greatest sales that we've made and the relationships we're most proud of have started because someone walked in and asked, what's that? And we got to start a conversation. And I think that hopefully uh, we can find more ways to have that type of engagement in an online setting as well, um, but that doesn't exist that well yet. And so for now, uh, for us, for Quitner, we're sort of wait, biding our time until the perfect white box shows up that we get to turn into what we want it to be. Uh, uh, now, I had one quick thing about retail space that I, I hope is okay. And it, it ties back to an earlier question that was raised. Um, I have found recently millennials and younger generations, it's fun since opening up my shop, those are the people who never engage you at shows. It, when they have come into my shop, they're the most engaging people. And they don't might not understand what an object is, but they are dying to learn about it, which is so exciting to me. And then the, the other point that I wanna bring up about millennials, um, Millennials might not have a ton of money to spend, but then they'll go to a five-star restaurant to, for an experience. And a retail space gives people the opportunity for experiences. And I, I don't think millennials mind spending money, but there has to be some sort of experience tied in with it. And as dealers, that's what we provide people. We provide people an experience buying an object. I mean, whether it's on the floor of the Winter Antique Show or Masterpiece or Mostert, or you go down the list, or even the Madison Antique Show in Madison, Georgia, where I had my brother do a show two weeks ago. Uh, you know, as long as people feel like we're giving an experience and, you know, a suit made on Savile Row is probably just as good as a suit, well, people completely disagree with me on this, made by hand anywhere. But that Savile Row name always will add another level of value. And so as a retail shopper and a retail antique dealer, I want to be able to listen to like my old dad's collecting buddies and who, you know, I walked into Albert Sachs and we talked about this piece for years and years and years. And then I bought it. I want that experience and I want to be able to provide people those experiences. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And actually another one of the sort of lines that Jamie gave me when I first started was he said, Karis, remember you are in the entertainment industry. You are not giving people anything they need. They're buying this, it's a luxury because it's entertaining, it's enjoyment. You've got to keep giving them that and they'll keep coming back to you. And that completely agrees with what you're, you're saying, Taylor. And it's true, you know, it's the whole experience. That point about the entertainment industry is so, so important. Like the reality is, is that no one needs a $10,000 bed. No one needs a $20,000 dish. Like you don't need it. You can, you can get a cheaper version that will be just as functional. But what we are trying to do is to convince people that surrounding themselves with things that are beautiful, that entertain them, that bring them joy is, is a luxury that's worth not just aspiring to, but manifesting in their lives. Um, and when Taylor mentioned people are willing to pay for the five course meal at a Michelin star restaurant, like this is a really amazing sideboard should give that same joy, not just for the two hours of a meal, but for the rest of your life that you own it. And it is 
through reminding people and sort of building that energy and showing our own enthusiasm for these things that we're able to convey that message that these aren't just objects. This is, this is experience. You know, I, I always joke with people. I, I've, in the past few years, I, I've actually enjoyed looking at my retirement plan. It, it's fun to watch it grow, but I'm never going to hang that on the wall and love it. And that's what, and I'm not saying antiques will ever grow, or I, I don't tell people to get in this business for investment purposes. But at the end of the day, you are buying an object that has a value and that should maintain or always be worth something. Now, if you bought at the top of the market and things change, that that's the reality of things. But, you know, you've also bought probably a uh, 50, most people buy cars, cars are $50,000 nowadays for a bare minimum. And 10, you know, five years from now, that car's not going to be worth that. It's just going to be something else to throw away. And that's the whole thing about millennials. They are a true throwaway culture. I mean, our cell phones are expensive. They're $1,000 nowadays, but we are going to throw them away in three years. So the great thing is that the, whether it's an antiquity that's lasted thousands of years or even a, you know, I, I'm looking at a piece of furniture made in the 1960s. It granted, it hadn't gone through that hard life yet, but it's still a great object. It's still maintaining great value. And I, I think the more we engage with people and thinking that we are investing in objects that are beautiful and they might change with time. They might you know, the sun might bleach them out a little bit, but there's at the end of the day, there's still beautiful objects and it's our honor to be stewards of these objects. You know, something I think about often as I look back at the, the periods um, that I specialize in, namely you know, 17th, 18th century England and America, um, you look at the, uh, the English country houses, for example, you know, or aristocratic residences of all stripes, and you think about the objects that filled them. And, you know, those objects, most of them, many of them, some of them at least have survived. Um, some of them are now adorning other, you know, contemporary aristocratic homes. But if you think about the fraction of wealth that these 18th century families invested in the material culture that they put in their homes, I mean, you know, can you imagine Mark Zuckerberg spending $20 billion on furniture for his house? I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Is, is investing enormous portions of your worldly uh, wealth into, um, into pieces of furniture, into silver, into paintings, um, things that maybe you saw as an investment, but, but more than that, you just saw as the hallmarks of, of a happy and successful existence. Um, and, you know, we've talked about experiences. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm constantly trying to get across um, to not just younger collectors, but frankly, to older collectors as well, is that, yeah, if, if you are buying the right kinds of objects, objects that, um, you know, to shamelessly steal from Marie Kondo that spark joy, then you are actually investing in an experience that you can have every day for the rest of your life and that will actually continue to, to grow and be even more rewarding uh, over time. Um, maybe even better than the, the you know, flashback Instagram photo album of your trip to Tahiti. Um, that, that, that's just my bias. Um, I see we've got a couple of questions coming in and I wanna make sure to, to save some time for that. Um, and you know, please keep those coming. Um, but I just want to wrap up um, our sort of uh, organized um, conversation here by asking each of you about the last uh, year, year and a half or so, you know, let's call it the COVID period. Um, and in just a minute or two, uh, tell me about the one discovery object, uh, whatever it may be, that really was most exciting for you. Uh, or, or for that matter, maybe the most exciting sale you've made. Um, and uh, let's kick off with Kim. I've discovered, it's always difficult to buy, but during COVID and during the pandemic, it was excruciatingly difficult. Um, 
it was very difficult to meet people, to see their homes, to see their collections, to go to estate sales, to do any of the things that we traditionally do. So that was a bit of a scramble. But I can't complain about the results of the pandemic. People were at home in front of their computers and they were buying things, lots of things in some cases. And earlier this year, I sold 50 objects in one week, which has never happened and I'm sure won't happen again anytime soon. And 40 of them were to the same client. So, uh, I, I mean, I was gratified, I was excited. I mean, it's so wonderful, but I am struggling just even now to replace these objects, these carefully considered, carefully researched pieces are gone. And, and now I have to, you know, replace that work. So I discovered maybe that it would be easier to sell something a little more commercial in these cases. Um, antiques are carefully considered purchases and, and they are they are difficult to come by and in a pandemic, almost impossible. Uh, let's go on to Pippa. So I have, I mean, I mentioned two things, one from the restoration repair side and one from the, the dealing acquisition object side. Uh, we just finished a project that we actually got in uh, really early in COVID um, that uh, was a dresser restoration for a sixth generation family farm in this area. The dresser had been sitting in pieces on the second floor of a barn. Um, and for us, that's sort of our dream piece to work on. It, it wasn't, it's, it doesn't make us a ton of money, uh, but it, it allows a family to keep a piece in their family. And to us, that's, that's one of those beautiful things that we can do is allow these families to keep their homes together. Um, and then probably the most fun recent find, uh, I'm a sucker for busts. We're big bust fans over here. <laughs> and uh, this is not an old one. It's a sort of WPA American era um, bus of Carl Stamberg uh, in plaster, nothing super fancy, but the, the fun thing that we found out, we found it at the small little country auction. We got it for almost nothing. And I say that uh, quite seriously. Uh, and then came to learn that Marilyn Monroe owns the same bus. Uh, and so you just learn these fun pieces of history. It's not a profoundly valuable object. There'll be a fun piece for someone to have in their collection and to look at. And it's, it's a, a curious man with a curious facial expression with this fun little piece of history. And I think that uh, for us is as well, sort of what attracts us to this business is the ability to bring these pieces into our home, to spend time with them, enough time to learn more about them and to be able to tell that story on to the next person. How about you, Taylor? Um, well, I, uh, the most exciting piece that I think I've found is actually a chest of drawers that um, I purchased it right at the beginning of COVID. And as antique dealers, the problem with COVID, um, I normally don't like to buy anything I can't put my hands on. And uh, because <laughs> throughout COVID, I have made plenty of COVID mistakes where I had great faith in pieces and um, made mistakes, but you know, you live and you learn. And this piece was at a auction house in the middle of nowhere, very far up in the frigid north. <laughs> and uh, when I got it home, I was like, oh my God. It was one of the earliest Surrey County, Virginia chest of drawers known. And in the antique world, there's a lot of things that I'll use the term that we find sexy. And original finish, original brass, and small size. Those are like the three biggies. And this had them all. And besides that, it, uh, it was super early, probably 1740, 50. And it was the earliest known OG foot chest of drawers made in the South that I know of. And I've talked to a few other people and they didn't know of many others that were that, that way. If it makes sense, the guy who built it was a cabinet maker who specialized in early more William and Mary ball style feet. And this one was just two big hunks of walnut that were slapped together to form an OG foot. And I'm sounding like a huge dork because I love 
feet on pieces and get excited by feet. Uh, not human feet, but antiques, yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I just think that it, it's so exciting that this object came from up north. I don't know how it made its way up there, but I, I was able to discover it. And like most great things, I put it on the online winter antique show. And that was one of the great things that sold this year at the winter show for us. Um, but you know, you still, you constantly are looking, you're constantly on the hunt and you just hope that you can find that one little thing that, that'll kind of bring the twinkle to your eye. And, uh, I, I, I'm glad we're coming out of COVID and have the chance to express our excitement over individual pieces with clients again. So, yeah. And how about you, Karis? Do you have any, uh, any um, secret fetishes you want to reveal to us? <laughs> Why do you mention it? <laughs> um, well, I'll keep this very quick because I'm aware of, of um, it getting on, but I've just brought up a picture actually on my phone. You thought it would show and tell probably a bit easier. So this is, oh, there's a bit of glare there, um, a, a Cycladic idol. So it was carved, it's about this high and was carved in, in 2600 BC. Um, but what's, I mean, it is a fantastic example of what it was. Wonderful piece to own, unrestored, great provenance, um, you know, and, and a beautiful thing that, you know, stylistically transcends time. I mean, you know, this kind of piece, you know, it, even to the modern aesthetic, it's wonderful. To ancient man, it was wonderful. Um, but what was really exciting about it as well is that, and I wouldn't have thought this possible, you know, this is a, 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 a sort of six figure piece. And, um, and we sold it via the Tefaf portal, they put it on, you know, as one of their sort of, this is one of our sort of important objects. And, and, you know, I spoke a little about it and someone who I didn't engage with directly because we, you know, hundreds of people tuned into this called up to buy it. And I thought this, I've never met this man. He's never met me. I've actually not even heard his voice, but the first thing he says is, oh, I saw this thing and, and I'm going to buy it. You know, I want it for a present for my wife. And I just thought, that's that's incredible actually you know the, the piece itself was thrilling to sell but also the situation I was like god I never if you had said to me a year and a half ago oh this is going to happen you know for such a sort of analog girl in such an analog industry you know you just the idea that that would be possible it's kind of just blows your mind and you think great well maybe we don't need our shop <laughs> maybe we just get Tefaf to do all our marketing for us you know <laughs> fantastic well congratulations um and, and thank you all very much. I think, uh, I think, Carrie, you can tell us, do we have time to um, get to some of these questions? Yes, uh, I think we can answer one or two. I want to be generous with the panelists' time, but we do have some, um, some exciting questions coming in. So Ben, if you want to go ahead and field those, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I'm seeing a, a couple of them have actually been addressed already in the, in the conversation. Um, Yeah, it's an interesting question here asked by an anonymous attendee um, who asks, uh, are millennials aware of trading up, uh, finding a starting point to furnish the first house and then working toward better quality or different eras uh, of attraction? Um, in other words, sort of developing taste over time uh, and also as presumably they get more purchasing power, you know, the ability to um, to go from maybe the, the B minus object to the B plus object and eventually to the A level object. Um, uh, do any of you have experiences with um, with younger collectors sort of engaging in that way? I think that we see collectors who aspire to have a nicer form of what they currently have, but the whole idea of, um, I mean, this, this really like gets into the issue of even like the process of home ownership for millennials and like access to capital and stability, um, which just is complicated. Of course, millennials is a long, it's a wide age range. I'm actually at the younger end of it. Um, but I, I don't know if there's this sort of constant thought in their head of one day I'll have something nicer it's more focused on the now and appreciating things right now. And in my experience, at least. Um, and so for us, something that we aspire to do is to help them see how maybe 
investing a little bit more in an individual object and having a few fewer things in a room can be worth it, can be the right decision. Um, now, I also speak from the perspective of someone who uh, is supposed to have a couch behind me and I don't because I'm really picky about couches uh, and I'm willing to wait six months to get a couch instead of buying what's available. Uh, but that's not true of everyone and not everyone wants to wait 15 years to be able to fought for their dream piece. And so I, I don't think that there's sort of this as much of an idea of uh, rotating a collection over time. It doesn't mean they won't do it, but it means they're not really thinking about it right now. I see a question here um, from someone asking about pricing. And uh, if I understand the question right, um, uh, what this person is getting at is that, you know, when you look through some of these online um, marketplaces, you can see uh, prices that often seem very high. You know, of course, there tends to be um, you're you're adding an, an extra middleman in there, and so there's another cut to be taken. And so you, you know, you can certainly find yourself in a position where prices are are um, kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, what do you think? And and this is you know particularly a challenge, I think. Um, you know, as, as sort of Karis, as you mentioned, it's although people are doing it, it can be hard also to wrap your head around buying something from somebody you've never met um, through through an online portal. Um, yeah, how do you think about pricing, um, particularly when you know it's one thing if you uh, have a, a clear idea of who your clients are, you know them, they come into your shop, you have an idea of what kind of negotiation they're they're going to conduct, um, but if you don't have that. Um, uh, sort of familiar relationship or expectation. You know, how do you think about, um, or do, does that affect the way you think about pricing uh, the, the pieces that you, uh, that you post online in particular? Is that, Kim, do you want, um, can, can you- uh, I'd be happy to. to that I'd be happy to, although I'll caution you from the beginning, there's no absolute about this at all. Everything factors in. So location factors in if I have to import something. I have to include the importation of that object. If something is completely unique, that's probably the hardest to price. And if something is searchable, researchable, you can take a look at comparables just like you would for real estate and see sort of uh, a baseline. But um, then you mentioned third parties. Um, there are so many considerations from rent to online marketplace fees that have to be taken into account, plus a little room maybe to negotiate. If you offer free shipping, nothing is free. <laughs> I mean, it is built into the price of the object. And um, I, I think you just do the very best you can. And this is one of the reasons that being a dealer for any length of time is helpful because you know the, the price of something isn't just you know an old saying is that you know it's worth what someone will pay for it today but earlier on someone talked about living with a piece uh Tara she said I think you said five years if I love it I'm good to hold on to it until I find the right home for it and so you know just selling Marie Zimmerman objects they have come to market and been like you know, all over the place from to be top highs to, you know, they've gone, people have not known what the piece was and it sold or maybe was passed. It, there, are, there are a million factors. And so really your traffic, if you're selling online, will tell you if a piece is far too expensive, but thousands of people have looked at it, that's a clue of nobody's reached out to you. You have to, you know, adjust and figure out what you're going to do. But if you put something on sale and it sells that day, perhaps you made a mistake in the opposite direction. I just want to jump in really quickly from like the perspective of most of what we sell is actually on the lower end of the market. And that's a decision that um, Ben and I, my husband and I made very early on in our business. We live in a very small town of less than 2000 people. Um, and from day one, we wanted to make sure that anyone in our town could walk in and buy something. Um, that decision has not always been hard to maintain um, because it means that we have to build in the fact that we have items for sale for $15 into our business model. 
Um, but that's something that we decided because we are in a small town where we feel it's really important that um, locals feel comfortable engaging with us just as much as people who are coming from further away who are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars are. Um, so there, for us often, um, almost built into the cost of our high, high price item is that ability to sell some things for less. Um, in the question, uh, you were specifically, the question, the asker was specifically asking about art. Art is extraordinarily subjective. Um, and there are pieces of art that we know we could sell for more that we choose not to, and pieces of art that we uh, refuse to sell for less. Uh, and we'll hold on to until someone's willing to pay for it. And and for us, that's a big part of being part of a community that's sort of unique in some ways to how we operate, um, where there's pieces we can't afford to let go of for less than a certain amount. And there's pieces we're willing to take less of a profit on in order to build the community aspect side of our business. May I say just one more thing? I, I think that is right on. Um, when you are putting together your business model cultivation is a really important part of what you should do to stay in business any length of time and having some modest parallel style objects to what you handle is key so I you know have some very lovely expensive pieces of handmade metal work but I will also carry parallel materials and era and makers that maybe aren't as well known, but I feel the quality is extraordinary. And those pieces for all of the reasons I just listed are a fraction of the price of something that you might, you know, gasp when you see if you come and ask a question and look at the website or what the show or whatever, a dealer might be able to guide you to something that is maybe not the same, but similar for the reasons that you like it and having sort of modestly priced objects is a solid business choice, I think. Well, thank you very much. I, th I think we had probably best leave it there um, considering the time, um, but uh, th this has been a lot of fun, at least for me. I, I hope it has been for you as well. Um, thank Carrie, you. I think that Thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Kim, Taylor, Pippa, and Cherries, thank you so much. Taylor, good luck with your drive. Um, that is an ambitious, <laughs> ambitious journey you're embarking on. Um, I hope all of our participants enjoyed today's discussion. I know we didn't get to every single question. If your question wasn't answered and you're just dying um, to have it answered, please email it to me um, at carrie at decorativeartstrust.org um, and I'll see what I can do about passing it along. But thank you again, that was fabulous. Um, and Ben, thank you so much for moderating uh, this conversation and for all of your thoughtful conversation questions. Um, if you enjoyed this program and you want to see more from the Decorative Arts Trust, please check out our YouTube page. Um, but otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and a lovely afternoon. So thank you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.